Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Faraby, and thanks to everyone here, especially uh, those in the room who have already heard me talk for about 50 minutes earlier today. I appreciate your attendance, and thank you. Um, uh, I want to clarify up front that this lecture is not a presentation of my research, but rather a clumsy attempt to coordinate a useful, even if incomplete and provisional sense uh, of the British modernist novel. So let's get to it. Part one, anxieties of a specialist. Though I, like my colleague Dr. Love, am a scholar of modernism, the word modernism makes me incredibly uneasy. Here's the thing. I don't, I, I don't really know what people mean when they use it in a sentence or even in an argument. Are they referring to the arts? Oops, I skipped that. There we go. To the arts that date from the late 19th through the mid 20th century, as the MSA website indicates? Or do they mean, as Eric Hayo would have it, an aesthetic mode of world denying that represents situations in which no single shared experience dominates, in which communication becomes cacophony? Do they mean to convey arts or artists that resist totalizing or geometrizing worldviews, even at the risk of becoming incomprehensible? Are they thinking, in other words, of an historical period that ends with two holocausts, the genocide perpetrated by the Nazis and the nuclear holocaust perpetrated by the United States? Or do they mean, as Vicki Mahaffey seems to prefer, the more general attempt of 20th and 21st century artists to grapple more immediately with an increasingly dynamic and contemporary reality? And what forms of grappling with reality does one identify as modernist? The minimalism of Ernest Hemingway, the encyclopedic breadth of James Joyce and Ezra Pound, the nostalgic shorings of T.S. Eliot, the neorealism of Willa Cather and D.H. Lawrence, the innovations of Langston Hughes or Nella Larson. How about the women of 1928? How about the contemporary metamodernism of Zadie Smith, Tom McCarthy, Alan Hollinghurst, Ali Smith, Ian McEwen, Kazuo Ishiguro, David Mitchell, Pat Barker, Moni Truong, Aaron Hati Roy, J.M. Coetzee, others? And if the word refers to an aesthetic mode rather than an historical period, then is the one using or abusing modernism even referring to the 20th century? Susan Stanford Friedman Socratically challenges scholars to envision a planetary modernist studies that would encompass the world across time in the long durée of human history, studying all aesthetic domains, styles, modes, and artifacts produced during periods of social, cultural, economic, technological, and or political acceleration. This provocative vision trans-historicizes modernities and modernisms, expanding the field's global coverage to include, for instance, 8th century Chinese poetry and 15th century North Indian poetry. These are the two examples up here, even if you can't read them. So. One might wonder if modernist studies could encompass or colonize romantic poetry or the 18th century novel, too. When aren't things accelerating, after all? Friedman's sense of planetary modernism also makes me uneasy about another word in my subtitle. For if modernities are polycentric and overlapping spatio-temporal fields of accelerated social change, and if modernisms are the aesthetic domains of these fields, then it becomes quite difficult to isolate a properly British modernity and modernism. We might come to see what comparativists already know, but it makes much more sense to speak from the get-go of a transnational, or transatlantic at least, modernism, if one is to speak of modernism at, at all. I cannot speak as a comparativist in ways that that field would recognize, the field of comparative literature. I don't have the necessary linguistic, historical, or deep cultural training. But it is worth noting, nonetheless, that a now canonical novelist like Jean Rhys, author of The Wide Sargasso Sea and the masterpiece Good Morning Midnight, was born in the Caribbean Commonwealth of Dominica. That James Joyce, who has been folded since the 1950s into books and courses and exam lists dedicated to British modernism, was, as I'm sure we all know, very Irish that D.H. Lawrence's wife, Frida, was German, that he lived his final years in Italy, died in France, and is interred, thanks to Frida and her later partner and husband, 
in New Mexico. That Virginia Woolf, or there she was, traces the disappearance of Victorian character in early 20th century novels, not to the ingenuity of young English youth, young English youth, ingenuity of English youth. I didn't write young English youth, don't worry. <laughs> but to the Constance Garnett translation of Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky. This is Wolf. quote, after reading Crime and Punishment and The Idiot, how could any young novelist believe in characters as the Victorian had painted them? We go down into characters like Raskolnikov as we descend into some enormous cavern. Lights swing about. We hear the boom of the sea. It is all dark, terrible, and uncharted." End quote. We'll be coming back to darkness, so don't worry. European painting also had a good deal of influence over British uh, writers. In her 1940 biography of Roger Fry, Wolf recounts how the post-impressionists whose work Fry introduced to London had a profound impact, quote, not to be restricted to the art of painting only, end quote. As we see in this passage, Fry charmingly attempts to ease the anxieties of Henry James, who is unsettled by Henri Matisse and Pablo Picasso by insisting that Cezanne and Flaubert are, quote, in a manner of speaking, after the same thing, end quote. Indeed, the transition in Matisse's work from Still Life with Peaches, 1895, to Le Bonheur de Vivre and Dishes and Melon is suggestive of the aesthetic impact Fry's exhibitions and lectures had among young painters and poets and novelists in London. Still Life with Peaches is certainly experimental in texture and style uh, and border and tone. I mean, you can see, for instance, the way that even the spoon, the way it's trying to capture uh, the refracted light, it's still in some sense attempting to capture the objects as they might appear uh, to an eye while Le Bonheur de Vivre appears to abandon viewpoint altogether. I know these examples of transnational affiliations, most of them still very Western, might just reinforce the canonical position of a select group of writers and artists whom I want to spend a lifetime studying. But the examples still illustrate, I think, that the integrity of whatever I might mean by British modernism is always already compromised by inspirations, blind spots, friendships, competitions, contagions, migrations, and sociocultural admixtures and appropriations. So whenever I use this phrase, I try to remember one of the great lessons of Jacques Derrida's of grammatology and put it sur rature, under erasure. Perhaps it would make sense to share my anxieties about the novel now. But the problem of genre here actually settles my anxieties. Well, just a bit, anyway. People who know me. I'm a little worried all the time. Instead of worrying about what modernism is or what is so British about British modernism, I can tell you with what certain writers bring to the English novel in the early to mid 20th century, or rather, following Dr. Clark's inaugural lecture on what one can do with genre, perhaps it might be better to investigate what the novel makes possible for certain 20th century writers who were born or who are closely associated with Britain. After all, novel theory tends to assign remarkable agency to the novel itself as a genre, agency to resist its own sedimentation. Though Ian Watt has become something of a common antagonist for contemporary theorists of the novel, his 1957 seminal work of criticism, The Rise of the Novel, does make a strong case, I think, for the genre's radical issue of, quote, established formal conventions and its challenge to a literary traditionalism whose primary criterion was conformity to accepted, recognizable, familiar, and well-established narrative models. Watt, of course, counterbalances this anti-traditionalism by establishing the rather restrictive limits of what he calls formal realism. But his initial point does resonate, at least in part, with Mikhail Bakhtin's theoretico-historical claim that, quote, the novel took shape precisely at the point when epic distance was disintegrating, when both the world and man were assuming a degree of comic familiarity, when the object of artistic representation was being degraded to the level of contemporary reality that was inconclusive and fluid. The novel, after all, these are some actually pretty fascinating sentences, has no canon of its own. It is by its very nature not canonic. It is plasticity itself. It is a genre that is ever questing, ever examining itself and subjecting its established forms to review. 
The history of the novel for Bakhtin is the history of literature's recurring engagements and encounters with the problem of contemporaneity, with the continuing and unfinished present. The novel as such for Bakhtin is marked by open-endedness. It is a genre of becoming rather than being, a genre whose spirit is process and inconclusiveness. In the spirit, then, of our inaugural lecture, and Bakhtin, and, of course, Wolf, who claims that everything is the proper stuff of fiction and that nothing is forbidden but only falsity and pretense, which is how she still gets it, Arnold Bennett. Right? I offer my title as the triangulation of what the novel makes possible for a few 20th century British modernists, namely invitations to tarry with difficulty, depth, and deformation. Part two, touring modernist difficulties. For a second, I thought I spelled it wrong, but I think, I think I'm good. It is a truth universally acknowledged that modernist novels are hard to read. <laughs> but in what way or ways might they be difficult? How do they obscure or initially outpace comprehension? It could be said that modernist novels find ways to challenge modernity's most recognized and recognizable mode of storytelling, realism. Indeed, most textbooks that define conventional fictional elements like plot, character, theme, setting, point of view, and so on usually default to realist narratives, or at least as realism is understood within modernist studies, as illustrations of what is most fundamental about narratives, short and long. While modernist novels vary a good deal on the scale of difficulty, most writers whom one might categorize as modernist appear in Gregory Castle's sorry about the cutoff there, Gregory Castle's words, to derealize realism and to capture or evoke anti-memetically something we might call clumsily just the real or something more real than realism can evoke. But what does this mean? Beginning on the shallower side of modernist difficulty, take the proposal of Mr. Wilcox to Margaret Schlegel in E.M. Forster's Howard's End a book I've been obsessed with as of late. So. Wilcox has invited Margaret to his home, which he claims to be selling. Since the Schlegel sisters and brother are in need of a new residence, he offers to provide it to her himself. If he liked her, Margaret wonders, might this be a maneuver to get her to London and result in an offer of marriage? And sure enough, from chapter 18, they proceeded to the drawing room. It was sallow and ineffective. One could visualize the ladies withdrawing to it while their lords discussed life's realities below to the accompaniment of cigars. Had Mrs. Wilcox's drawing room looked thus at Howard's end? Just as this thought entered Margaret's brain, Mr. Wilcox did ask her to be his wife, and the knowledge that she had been right so overcame her that she nearly fainted. But the proposal was not to rank among the world's great love scenes. Miss Schlegel, his voice was firm. I have had you up on false pretenses. I want to speak about a much more serious matter than a house. Margaret almost answered, I know. <laughs> Could you be induced to share my, is it probable? Oh, Mr. Wilcox, she interrupted, holding the piano and averting her eyes. I see, I see, I will write you afterwards if I may. He began to stammer. Miss Schlegel, Margaret, you don't understand. Oh yes, indeed yes, said Margaret. I'm asking you to be my wife. So deep already was her sympathy that when he said this, she made herself give a little start. I like, she made herself give a little start. She must show surprise if he expected it. An immense joy came over her. It was indescribable. It had nothing to do with humanity and most resembled the all-pervading happiness of fine weather. Fine weather is due to the sun, but Margaret could find no central radiance here. She stood in his drawing room happy and longing to give happiness. On leaving him, she realized that the central radiance had been love. You aren't offended, Miss Schlegel? How could I be offended? There was a moment's pause. He was anxious to get rid of her, and she knew it. So uh, she had too much intuition to look at him as he struggled for possessions that money cannot buy. He desired com comradeship and affection, but he feared them, and she, who had taught herself only to desire, held back and hesitated with him. Goodbye, she continued. You will have a letter from me. I'm going back to Swanage tomorrow. Thank you. Goodbye, and it's you, I think. I may order the motor around, mayn't I? That would be most kind. I wish I had written instead. Ought I to have written? Not at all. There's just one question. She shook her head. He looked a little bewildered, and they parted. 
No grand declaration of love, no immediate sense of love, only a retrospective recognition of its radiance. No clear object of Margaret's joy. Is she really happy that her dead friend's husband is proposing to her? Does she want to be his wife, or is she just happy she was right? No evidence, really, other than the arrangement of the visit itself that either of them want or desire to be spouses. As a major event, or what one would normally think a major life event, the reader of realist fiction might wonder why it is not given more time or space, why it is spoiled by Margaret's earlier premonition, why the dialogue is prefaced and interrupted by an intrusively informal narrator. And what is one to make of the fact that Margaret says yes before Wilcox can even propose, or that the yes is not an acceptance but an acknowledgement? Yes, I know what's happening here. Isn't it so exciting? Margaret is, after all, so self-aware in this scene, recognizing the moment as if it had already been written, anticipating what Wilcox will say, what he feels, consciously conforming her answers and her silences to the ready-madeness and the short-handedness of it all. One senses here the sheer repeatability and interchangeability of proposals. Best perhaps not to draw it out, get the business done with, and separate the characters so that Margaret, the primary focalizing character of the novel, has some space to think. But in realizing a typical realist proposal scene, Forster nevertheless captures or evokes some actualities here. The stuttering awkwardness of marriage proposals, the stirring of unrecognizable emotion, the problem of locating the source or object from or toward which the radiance of love is directed or disseminated or gathered. They're not overly taxing. Forster's portrayal of this proposal midway through his novel no doubt raises difficulties regarding what one should find significant in novels. How the conventions of realism can fold back against themselves when characters recognize the conventions of the very scene they're in. But we are, in truth, in the shallow end of modernism's difficulty here. With the opening page of Mrs. Dalloway, the waters begin to rise. Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself. For Lucy had her work cut out for her. The doors would be taken off their hinges. Rumpelmayer's men were coming. And then, thought Clarissa Dalloway, what a morning, fresh as if issued to children on a beach. What a lark, what a plunge, for so it had always seemed to her when, with a little squeak of the hinges, which she could hear now, she had burst open the French windows and plunged at Burton into the open air. How fresh, how calm. Stiller than this, of course, the air was in the early morning, like the flap of a wave, the kiss of a wave, chill and sharp, and yet, for a girl of 18, as she then was, as she then was, solemn, feeling as she did, standing there at the open window, that something awful was about to happen. Looking at the flowers, at the trees with the smoke winding off them, and the rooks rising, falling, standing and looking until Peter Walsh said, musing among the vegetables, was that it? I prefer men to cauliflowers. Was that it? He must have said it at breakfast one morning when she had gone out onto the terrace. Peter Walsh. He would be back from India one of these days, June or July, she forgot which, for his letters were awfully dull. It was his sayings, one remembered, his eyes, his pocket knife, his smile, his grumpiness. And when millions of things had utterly vanished, how strange it was, a few sayings like this about cabbages. I have to turn my page here. Well, the difficulty of Forster concerns the disalignment of the master narrative of courtship uh, from the swift, awkward, and self-conscious presentation of Margaret's excited non-answer. Here one encounters more fundamental difficulties, obscurities at the level of fiction's most basic elements. Where and when are we? To whom do we describe some of these words? To a narrator or to a character? And what kind of narrator is this? And who are these characters? And why should I care about flowers and trees and birds and cabbages? As my intro to criticism students, some of whom are here, have come to learn, there are not these are not sentences to be skimmed, but to be read slowly and to be reread after finishing the novel. And in some sense, it's clear that these are sentences that are begging to be reread. And yet, though we may not know from the evidence of this passage the year, 1923, or the present setting, London, June, Wednesday, or how much time has passed since Clarissa was 18, nearly 35 years, or when Peter will be returning to London, Clarissa will be seeing him in a few hours, and though we will have to face several challenging pages before meeting Septimus Smith, for whom certain words here 
will carry much different connotations. Did he plunge holding his treasure? One can still learn and infer a great deal from this brief excerpt. The difficulty of the passage, its obscurity becomes an occasion for learning to read and think character, the experience and presentation of time, the swift blurring of affects, the combinatory perception and remembrance or forgetting of other lives, to think these things and to think them differently. Difficulty can become an occasion, a motivating call and condition and resource to reconceptualize the very building blocks by which one narrativizes and individualizes not only the novel, but also other discursive unities, like the self, the community, the book, and the nation. Even if, we all, e even if all we observe here is a mundane sounds capacity, to this, the sort of little squeak of the hinges, to evince the survival of sensations that link the past and the present, we might come to sense that this passage, these sentences, show us what the novel as novel can do. But there are other difficulties of modernism, and with James Joyce's Ulysses, we encounter one of the most extreme derealizations of realism. Here are the first few paragraphs of his third episode, Proteus. You can't see it, the top line. Well, maybe, whatever, I'll just read it. Okay. Ineluctable modality of the visible, at least that if no more thought through my eyes. Signatures of all things I am here to read. Sea spawn and sea rack, the nearing tide, that rusty boot. It's not green, blue, silver, rust, colored signs. Limits of the diaphane, but he adds in bodies. Then he was aware of them bodies before of them colored. How? By knocking a sconce against them, sure. Go easy. Bald he was and a millionaire. Maestro de Colo Cesano. Limits of the diaphane in. Why in? Diaphane, a diaphane. If you can put your five fingers through it, it is a gate. If not, a door. Shut your eyes and see. Stephen closed his eyes to hear his boots crush, crackling rack and shells. You are walking through it, howsomever. I am a stride at a time, a very short space of time through very short times of space. Five, six, then I can enter. Exactly, and that is the ineluctable modality of the audible. Open your eyes. Not nah, Jesus, if I fell over a cliff that beetles over his base, fell through the Niven and Ander ineluctably, I'm getting on nicely in the dark. My ash sword hangs at my side. Tap with it, they do. My two feet in his boots are at the end of his legs, Niven and Ander. Sounds solid, made by the mallet of Los Demiurgus. Am I walking into eternity along Sandy Mount Strand? Crush, crack, crick, crick, wild sea money. Dominic Gdeezy kens them. Won't you come to Sandy Mount, Madeline, Madeline the mare? Rhythm begins, you see. I hear a catalectic tetrameter of ions marching. No, a gallop, divine the mare. Open your eyes now. I will, one moment. Has all vanished since? If I open and am forever in the black, I die and basta. I will see if I can see. See now, there all the time without you, and ever shall be, world without end. I have to flip more pages here. Where does one even begin to inventory the difficulties that face Joyce's readers here? In the first two episodes of Ulysses, Telemachus and Nestor, Joyce intermixes traditional third-person narration with what is now commonly called stream-of-consciousness writing. He rarely signals the transition from traditional to experimental narration, though it becomes clear relatively quickly that passages which readers find most confusing are thought transcriptions of Stephen Dedalus, the main character of Joyce's earlier novel, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. The sentence I've emphasized in red here helps visualize how Joyce has scaled the difficulty of his novel even higher in his third episode. It is the only instance of third-person narration on the screen meaning that readers do not encounter a stream, but a deluge of consciousness. When I first read Ulysses, I had no way of knowing that these sentences include references to Aristotle, or Jacob Bohem, German mystic, or Dante, or George Berkeley, an Irish philosopher and bishop, or William Blake, or Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, or William Shakespeare, but even if I were able to catch these references, they do not necessarily help me understand that Stephen Dedalus is alone walking on a beach with his eyes closed. Only these regional references would be of aid. Of course, the stuff also about audibility and visibility. And only if, but only if I knew what and where Sandy Mount Strand is. 
So we see that modernist novels like Ulysses, even if it is a rather extreme example, do not just challenge the conventions of realist narration. Moreover, in doing so, they are highly allusive and intertextual, referencing, often without citing, not only literature, painting, sculpture, and music from antiquity up to the respective dates of publication, but also religious, imperialist, economic, political, philosophical, military, urban, agricultural, industrial, scientific, and technological histories, discourses, and sensibilities. This is the case even in, a much sim even in much simpler scenes. Joyce figures the first scene of the novel, for instance, in which a sleepy and displeased Stephen Dedalus watches Buck Mulligan shave atop Martello Tower as a parody of the traditional Latin mass. This is much easier, don't worry. Here's the first paragraph of the novel, very famous. Also, part of an incomplete uh, graphic serialization, which is free online for anyone who wants to look at it. Stately plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown ungirdled was sustained gently behind him on the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned, In Troibo adultery day. It helps to know, does it not, that this Latin phrase, untranslated in the novel, means I will go up to the altar. But it is among the first sentences spoken at the Mass that it opens a ritual that includes the consecration of bread and wine, host and blood, bowl and lather, and the communion of the priest and the faithful in memory, Christ says, of me. It would not be a stretch, then, if we knew this, to say that the novel begins with a parody of a ritual of remembrance, an insight not insignificant, I think, in a novel that is largely about remembrance, recollection, recognition, recursiveness, return, ritual, and routine like the kind of recollections and mental references Daedalus makes on Sandy Mount Strand, like the ritual of withdrawing from company for a walk upon the beach, like the routine of shaving. While our literature might be more or less difficult to this or that reader for a variety of reasons, the difficulties of the modernist novels I study and teach take a rather peculiar form. They audaciously invite readers to tarry indefinitely and without promise of eventual lucidity or coherence with the obscure, complex, ambiguous, confusing, baffling, and unintelligible. The acceptance of such a perverse invitation troubles the usual equation of reading novels with knowing, knowing what the narrator wants us to know, knowing coherent and self-sufficient characters, knowing how one event leads to the next aligning it instead with working slowly at various levels of intensity at the horizons of the knowable and thinkable. This work, moreover, despite the polished, impressive prose of so many modernist writers, takes the unlikely form of collaboration. Modernist narr narrators do not provide me with everything I may need to know. Characters are fragmented, ob events are obscured, significance is confused and deferred. The reader must become something like a fellow author, a co-creator of the text's meaning in ways alien to other kinds of reading. And so in ways that do not necessarily mark complex texts like William Wordsworth's The Prelude, or John Milton's Paradise Lost, or George Eliot's Middlemarch, the British or Irish modernist novel implores readers to work uncertainly with the open-endedness and unfinishedness which drives the novel as novel to carry on its ongoingness and presentness into other com incomplete presents. I've always liked Mahaffey, Vicky Mahaffey, who I had up earlier, her defense of modernism's difficulty. Sorry, I don't have a slide about this, so you'll just have to listen. She writes, the role of the reader in modernist literature is to play all the different parts in the story or poem in order to gain an understanding or feeling of how or why they come together. It is to embrace the daunting, the foreign, and the multifaceted without anxiety and without deference. To accept partnership with the unknown author is not only erotic, oh my, it is spiritual in the deepest sense of the term, traveling without a known destination. The willingness to engage playfully, provisionally, and also respectfully with what we do not know, do not yet know, or care about is also deeply ethical." End quote. And yet, Mahaffey's defense of modernist difficulty may go a bit too far. For it misses the dark side of modernism and the disquieting ways in which it also invites readers to face the difficulty of depth and deformation. Only about 45 minutes, more minutes, don't worry. 
The depth I invoke here is not that of intellectual profundity or complexity, but rather the subtle slide from the expansiveness of a single self, a single day, a past which can infiltrate and flood every single moment to the widest expanse imaginable. The deep, the dark, the abyssal, the cosmic, the void. For ages that stagger the imagination, H.G. Wells writes in the outline of history. This earth spun hot and lifeless. And again, for ages of equal vastness, it held no life above the level of the anima animaculae in a drop of ditch water. Not only is space from the point of view of life and humanity empty, but time is empty also. Life is like a little glow, scarcely kindled yet, in these void immensities. Or take the closing sentences of Wolf's essay on not knowing Greek. Quote, with the sound of the sea in their ears, vines, meadows, rivulets about them, they, that is the ancient Greeks, are even more aware than we are of a ruthless fate. There is a sadness at the back of life which they do not attempt to mitigate. Entirely aware of their own standing in the shadow, and yet alive to every tremor and gleam of existence, there they endure. And it is to the Greeks that we turn when we are sick of the vagueness, of the confusion, of the Christianity and its consolations of our own age. And that's how she ends the essay. This passage has preoccupied me for some time, especially the phrase of underlined, a sadness at the back of life. It means the haunting fact, I think, not only of the shadow of death cast over us all, but something far more disquieting than that. But despite the tremors and gleams of existence, which might seem to give consolation to those who are, who are aware of the shadow, that there is no possible mitigation. This fate is ruthless because careless, mindless, purposeless, indifferent to how long or whether or not we might learn to be alive to the non-conscious tremors and gleams, which are not for us. I have no historical or empirical investment in Wolf's account of ancient Greek poetry, philosophy, or drama, but it seems to me that this passage is suggestive of a largely unacknowledged pattern in her writing. So now this is the part where it becomes a talk about Wolf most, most exclusively, so sorry about that. A pattern, uh, a pattern that I call, or uh, a pattern in her writing, what I call intimations of cosmic indifference, glimpses of a dark ontology, reminders of how little existence cares about the fate awaiting all life forms, cultures, and ecosystems on this planet. So, happy stuff. Wolf's first novel, The Voyage Out, for instance, focalizes for the most part around, the, around young Rachel Vinrace, who learns to challenge religion, to find but be critical of love, to abhor violence, to enjoy education, but question its entanglement with gender hierarchies and gender norms. This is a spoiler coming up, so sorry. Only to contract a, a fever 40 pages away from the end of the novel and to die 20 pages later. The effect on other characters and potentially on the reader is initially quite aggressive. There must be a reason, one character insists. It can't only be an accident. But one Mrs. Paley figuring the blank stare of the deep, struggles to feel the suddenness of Rachel's death at all. Miss Vinray's dead, she asks. Dear me, that's very sad. But I don't at the moment remember which she was. This is after 300 pages of us right, reading about this character. In an aesthetic move arguably possible only in a novel, Wolf invites readers to tarry in the aftermath of Rachel's death, the insignificance of which grows more palpable in the novel's final chapter. The narrative economy here is fascinating, since it barely men mentions Rachel, who so dominates most of the novel's ideation or ideation and dramatization, detailing the passing of a storm over the South American resort of Santa Marina, and later roaming among conversations of the hotel guests who are discussing knitting and reading, even when St. John Hurst, who had befriended Rachel and her aunt several chapters earlier, joins the hotel's company, her name is barely mentioned. The concern is with and for her fiancé, Terence Hewitt. Poor guy. And as he takes a reprieve from comforting his friend, quote, without any sense of disloyalty to Terence or Rachel, he ceased to think about either of them. He was content to sit silently, watching the pattern build itself up, looking at what 
he hardly saw. End quote. The novel ends one page later with stunning descriptions of the sky, some talk of chess, and the voices of other guests, quote, passing St. John one after another on their way to bed, end quote. Fini. The world keeps turning and Rachel fading. We like this many more difficult passages of the deep from Wolf's oeuvre, the time passes section into the lighthouse, the vision of a devastated post-apocalyptic London that she tucks into a corner of Mrs. Dalloway, the allusions to deep to the deep time of prehistory in between the acts. One of the more extreme and direct modernist meditations on the non-attitude of nothingness appears in the little-known modernist novel Spleen by Olive Moore. I can say a bit more about the novel's content uh, if people are interested, but uh, but for now, I just want to look at this passage, which concerns the meditations of a woman named Ruth, the main character, who had been living on a small Mediterranean island during World War I. In fact, she's on the island for like 22 years, but in that time frame, World War I comes and goes. Right. Anyway, here it is. Suspended in an island space, she watched it all. It seemed a matter of hundreds of thousands of tons of high explosives against hundreds of thousands of men who had nothing whatsoever against each other, and were being labeled, thrown in, fed into the slaughter with brave sounding finality. Like a watcher from another world, she would stand and look across at the mainland, stopping short to try to grasp that the sun shone over all, or rain fell, and the year went through its gestation, birth and death, and nothing was changed. Not one single leaf its color or wave its way in response to the monstrous happenings across a small strip of water. The earth then was not for man, but man, what a harvest he was garnering now, was for the earth, the earth not caring at all. I'm not going to produce a reading of this passage, I just want to leave it hanging out there, all dark, terrible, and uncharted. Why would modernists invite us to attend to the blank stare of the void? Why would anyone choose to acknowledge the shadow? Why seek out the ancient Grecian sadness? Recall Wolf's words of turning to the Greeks when one is sick of the vagueness, of the confusion, of the Christianity and its consolations of our own age. It seems to me that the novel as Bakhtin envisions it, unfinished, open-ended, enables British modernists to draw something from the depths to fashion a cosmic point of view that upsets and deforms not only the self-important, individualist, realist sense of the self, but also the spontaneous, assumed value of keywords and institutions like the human being, like reason, like civilization, patriotism, and even education. In Mrs. Dalloway, when Septimus Smith is poised to plunge from the window of his apartment on the, gu on the guardrails below, he thinks, quote, sorry, this is another spoiler, it was their idea of tragedy, not his or Rezia's. This is his wife, for she was with him. Holmes and Bradshaw, his doctors, liked that sort of thing. He sat on the sill, but he would wait till the very last moment. He did not want to die. Life was good. The sun was hot. Only human beings. What did they want? Coming down the staircase opposite, an old man stopped and stared at him. Holmes was at the door. I'll hit at you, he cried, and flung himself vigorously, violently down onto Mrs. Filmer's area railings. Just a page later, after Dr. Holmes drugs Smith's wife, the narrator jump cuts to Peter Walsh, presumably watching the very ambulance taking away Smith's dead body. Peter is unaware of the circumstances and does not know Septimus, but it is clear that Wolf is doing some sort of critical work through his exclamation. So this is Peter Walsh. One of the triumphs of civilization, Peter Walsh thought. It is one of the triumphs of civilization as the light high bell of the ambulance sounded Swiftly, cleanly, the ambulance sped to the hospital, having picked up instantly, humanely, some poor devil. Someone hit on the head, struck down by disease, knocked over perhaps a minute or so ago at one of these crossings, as might happen to oneself. That was civilization. It struck him, coming back from the East, the efficiency, the organization, the communal spirit of London. Only human beings. What did they want? The humane ambulance. That was civilization. Here in the paratactic juxtaposition of suicide and supposed salvation, insanity and sanity, Septimus and Peter, we see a thread of continuity between the modernist derealization of realism, made possible by the open-endedness of the novel form, and the critical deformation of those systems, values, and structures responsible for war, for death, 
for the suffocating, frightening, and isolating existence of the Smiths after settling in London. Septimus figures much like old Mrs. Paley in The Voyage Out as the gaze of the void, which deforms the self-evident value of efficiency, organization, and communal spirit, unimpressed by the civilization which could not see him, could not recognize his loss, could not attend to the fact that for him the war was not over. From the cosmic perspective of Septimus, human being itself becomes quite mad, an antagonist of life, a poisonous effort to mitigate a sadness at the back of life, which it cannot escape. I'm almost done, I promise. The critical deformations of modernism and the difficult depths that make them possible may not always be depressing or antagonistic. They can be surprisingly amorous and refreshingly moving, refreshingly moving. Think back on Mahaffey's sense of the reader's erotic, spiritual, and ethical approach to the unknown or strange. And speaking of strange, I want to conclude with D.H. Lawrence. I'll spare you a long Lorenzian passage and share instead an excerpt from Aldous Huxley's introduction to the 1931 Selected Letters of Lawrence, published the year after his death. In this anecdote, Huxley relates the first time he ever met privately with the older novelist, although he wasn't that much older, to capture what he calls the important fact of Lawrence, a sense of how powerfully and immediately Lawrence could affect and undo others. He writes, quote, the place was London, the time 1915, his, that is Lawrence's passionate talk, was of the geographically remote and of the personally very near. Of the horrors in the middle distance, war, winter, the town, he would not speak, for he was on the point, so he imagined, of setting off to Florida, where he was going to plant that colony of escape of which up to the last he never ceased to dream. Before tea was over, remember this is the first time they've ever hung out together, before tea was over he asked me if I would join the colony. And though I was an intellectually cautious young man, not at all inclined to enthusiasms, though Lawrence had startled and embarrassed me with sincerities of a kind to which my upbringing had not accustomed me, I answered yes. Fortunately, with the uh, perspective of hindsight, fortunately, no doubt, the Florida scheme fell through. And it was better that it should have remained, as it always was to remain, a project and a hope. And I knew this even as I said I would join the colony. But there was something about Lawrence which made such knowledge, when one was in his presence, curiously irrelevant. What mattered was always Lawrence himself, was the fire that burned within him, that glowed with so strange and marvelous a radiance in almost all he wrote. While Huxley is certainly a bit guilty of hyperbole here with that almost, we are talking about the novelist who uses the phrase, the sex thing, over and over and over again in his novels. It seems to me that this scene of invitation nonetheless shares uncanny correspondences with the invitations I've been attempting to sketch out here. Audacious invitations to approach texts that challenge, startle, embarrass, and confuse, and potentially even undo the reader, without necessarily promising a satisfying reward. Perhaps modernist novels are a bit like Lawrence, uncomfortably either near or far, refusing to sit at a comfy middle distance, inviting one to think, to be otherwise, to flirt with difficulty and deformation, if only for a moment, and sometimes potentially for a lifetime. Thank you. <laughs>